Hi, my name is Bob Doherty. I'm an aerospace engineer with a specialty in aeroacoustics. This year, my aeroacoustics colleagues gave me a, a big honor, the 2020 AIAA Aeroacoustics Award. Part of the ceremony for this award is a lecture. The lecture could be about any topic that I like, and I had planned to discuss the history of airframe noise starting from the 1930s going through the present. As I was working on that, I saw what was happening with COVID-19 and did a little bit of reading about the, the influenza virus. I found that influenza is seasonal, and the most accepted reason for the seasonality is the change of the indoor environment, principally humidity, with seasons. This caused me to wonder how the virus particles inside a respiratory droplet could know about the humidity outside the droplet, and I did some more reading. What I found was a, a, a field called aerobiology that um, has some content in fluid mechanics and even occasionally acoustics. So it overlaps somewhat with the field of aeroacoustics. Decided to make, the, make that the subject of my lecture, both to introduce the field to my colleagues as potentially an interesting uh, topic to work on, and also to mention some tips for potentially reducing the spread of coronavirus. I took these tips from a paper the, in the Annual Review of Virology. Uh, the first two tips concern controlling humidity and increasing ventilation. Uh, these address uh, overlapping but somewhat different uh, modes, potential modes of the propagation of a respiratory virus. The humidity one in particular uh, is based on the assumption that um, coronavirus will turn out to be seasonal uh, like the influenza virus is, but we don't know that yet. Uh, there's some information, but it's not enough. Uh, another another caveat that I should mention is that it's not my intention, as I talk about the field of aerobiology, to add to that field, since it's not mine. Uh, in fact, what I'm trying to do is not subtract from it by presenting the information that I found in the papers as carefully as I can. Uh, with that introduction, let's go to the lecture. First, I'll briefly review the technologies cited in my Aeroacoustics Award, phased array technology and the cell design analytical tools. Then I'll switch topics and talk about the propagation of COVID-19 by respiratory droplets. This actually is a phenomenon in aerobiology in the field of aerosol science, rather than aeroacoustics and aerospace engineering. But there is some overlap, and I'll point that out as I go along. I'll finish with a proposal for using a, a mathematical tool from duct acoustics to model part of the respiratory tract and emphasize the case for controlling humidity as a way to reduce the propagation of COVID-19. Citation calls for contributions to experimental air acoustics uh, in the area of phased array technology and optimal nacelle design and analytical tools. A phased array is an arrangement of microphones that makes a map of the source distribution. So it assumes a region in space containing acoustic sources, and data from the microphones was processed with a beamforming algorithm in the computer to make an image of the sound source distribution. An early test of this technology was done in the 7x10 wind tunnel at NASA Ames. The setup included a phased array on the right side, making an image of the wind tunnel model, in particular the lateral uh, edge of the flap. The participants from Boeing included um, me, Dan Scharf, Jim Underbrink, and Guy Newbert. Uh, participants from NASA Ames included Bruce Storms and Cliff Horn, among others. Uh, the technique, the experiment was very successful, and the technique's gone on to be used in wind tunnels around the world. Uh, there's also a flyover version that was developed by um, DLR, um, principally by Ulf Mikkel. 
um, both the flyover and the wind tunnel versions make images of, of um, airframe noise sources, um, like this picture from Rob Stoker. Uh, the flyover version also um, produces images of engine noise. The sound produced by a jet of air can also be imaged with a phased array. This is a test set up, set up at NASA Glenn. The phased array is the square object on the left, and the jet nozzle is the two-inch diameter Char facility. Uh, here's some, some data processed in two different ways. It's an underexpanded supersonic jet, and you can see the noise made by the shock cell pattern. Okay, the other topic is nacelle design analytical tools. Um, I have to mention my uh, graduate advisor, uh, Jim Coronas, taught me how to convert an elliptic equation into a system of parabolic equations and then decouple them to um, solve a, a problem by a marching parabolic solution, which is much faster than solving the um, similar elliptic problem. Uh, I applied this to duct acoustics. Um, in addition, I, I used um, a ray tracing code to analyze uh, nacelle acoustic lining. So this is a picture of uh, ray tracing. So we assume that the sound sources are on the, the fan of the um, turbofan engine. The sound propagates from the fan to the microphone. Some of the propagation paths include reflections from the um, inner surface of the nacelle. These are treated with acoustic lining, which re removes some of the energy. And uh, ray tracing can be used to analyze the performance of a proposed um, inlet uh, lining design. C duct is the parabolic approximation code. So we have a, a model of the, in this case, the aft fan duct of a turbofan engine. Uh, noise is incident on the left side of the grid on the upper left and propagates along the duct and exits from the right side. As it's propagating, uh, the solution obeys the lateral boundary conditions uh, determined by the impedance, the modeled impedance of the acoustic lining. Uh, it was actually a little surprising that applying the parabolic approximation with these boundary conditions would pr produce the right answer, but it did. Experiments at Boeing and a lot of later work by um, NASA Langley have shown that the C-duct is quite accurate. Um, there are some examples of, of predicted um, sound in the duct on the right. Uh, NASA Langley took the core C-duct um, code and embedded it in a larger package called C-Duct Lark that includes um, automatic mesh generation and um, uh, flow solution to provide the, the environment that the C-Duct runs in. Since then, they've, they've used it for um, several purposes and it's been very successful. Okay, switching to SARS, this is a picture of the um, COVID-19 Viron. Uh, for this story, the important part of the picture is the lipid membrane on the outside. That, produ that pr protects the, um, the RNA material in the virus from environmental factors. We can see that the diameter is, is about 0.1 microns. Now, the COVID-19 virus hasn't been studied very well because it's only been around for less than a year. Influenza um, virus is similar and also has a lipid membrane. Uh, so it has, uh, at least is expected to have similar um, environmental characteristics as the um, SARS-2 virus. It, one of the most stri striking features of the influenza uh, virus is it's seasonal. So in areas that are not near the equator, uh, the virus is present in the winter and not in the summer. Um, it's, there's been debate for a long time about the reason. Um, but I, I believe the reason is clear now, and, and I'll get to it. The behavior is different near the equator, and in that area, in tropical regions, the virus occurs year-round. The reason for that is it's, it's a different propagation mechanism that happens in tropical regions. There are also summer viruses. They don't have a limpid envelope like the influenza virus and coronaviruses do, and they actually prefer a humid environment. Okay, the explanation of the seasonality of influenza um, occurred in 2007 when Lowen at Emory University uh, 
took some guinea pigs and put them in cages uh, with airflow between the cages. And the upstream guinea pigs were deliberately infected with influenza. Uh, it's not as bad as it seems because guinea pigs apparently have a mild response to influenza. But um, some of them were infected and some of them were exposed by air blowing over the infected ones. Uh, the test was done at 5 degrees centigrade and 20 degrees centigrade and at different um, levels of relative humidity. And what Lowett found is that at low relative humidity, there was perfect transmission from the infected guinea pigs to the uninfected ones. At intermediate relative humidity, about 50%, there was very little transmission. Uh, I'm referring to the dashed line, which is the 20 degrees C case. Uh, at higher humidity, uh, the infection went up and then back down again. Uh, that, at that time, that was, it was not clear what the reason for that was, but it's become clear since then. Um, that at 5 degrees C, there was a similar curve, but shifted. So this shows that uh, the envir environmental uh, influence of, of humidity and temperature are uh, drive the transmission of um, influenza. And that explains seasonality because in temperate zones, uh, indoor spaces are, are heated in the in the winter, and this, this reduces the, the relative humidity, uh, creating an environment that's favorable for virus transmission. Um, Twenty fourteen, Lowen published another paper, reporting uh, that she repeated this test using a different strain of influenza, and also replotted the data as a function of absolute humidity instead of uh, relative humidity, and found a, a better collapse with absolute humidity. So she proposed that that might be the more relevant um, factor. Of course, if you're talking about a constant temperature like indoor, it doesn't really matter. But to under, understand the science, it's important to find the right parameter that collapses it. Um, she also reported some work by Yang at, and, and um, Mar at Virginia Tech, who did who um, studied the stability of, of the influenza virus uh, in a laboratory and found uh, an explanation for the for the rise in infectivity at, at high humidity. Their theory was that uh, droplets of the of of water respiratory um, droplets containing the virus um, evaporate over time. Uh, initially, the um, the virus droplet contains the same water that the virus came from, so it's so it's stable. Uh, as the water evaporates, the um, pH and the um, salinity, the pH gets lower, the salinity gets higher. One or the other of those is toxic to the virus, uh, so it becomes non-infective. If the humidity is low enough that the, that the um, uh, droplet uh, evaporates completely, then the virus is, is not exposed to the water. But it's, but it's still protected by its lipid envelope, so its survival rises again. So that, that, that the um, effect of improved virus survivability at high humidity was the new feature that Lowen didn't initially appreciate. Um, so uh, her paper says that you know transmission experiments as well as um, climatic. Uh, dependence of of of, um, of influence uh, confirm the or, or at least very strongly support the environmental um, influence of humidity and also temperature, which I'm not talking about that much. So the mechanisms for that um, are involve the respiratory droplet, as in the paper by Yang, um, the virus itself, and it's Reaction to the um, to the chemistry in the droplet, and there are also factors of the of the um, host, the um, intrinsic uh, receptivity of, of the person to being to being infected that can change with humidity. Okay, so the respiratory droplet transmission um, 
involves droplets that range from less than one micron in diameter to 100 microns or larger. Um, they're, they start out as saline solutions containing 5% non-volatile matter um, uh, enzymes and cells and things. Uh, droplets, respiratory droplets are involved, are created by several um, stages of respiration. A cough produces 3,000 droplets that are emitted at 10 meters per second. Uh, sneeze uh, produces 40,000 droplets at 50 meters per second. Breathing produces very few droplets. Talking um, produces a one to five droplets per second, or the um, uh, rate of production depends on the, um, the the pressure squared of the loudness of the speech. So this was shown by a seed in 2019. Uh, this the same paper in 2019 also shows that that uh, some of the subjects are super emitters uh, who emit eight to 13 uh, droplets per second instead of one to five. And this paper was written before. Super emitters was, was a well-known um, term in the context of, for example, the, the choir episode in Washington State or the bar mitzvah in um, New York where one person infected a lot of other people by just talking or in the case of the choir singing. Okay, um, there are a couple of setups for measuring the emission of particles from people. Uh, one of them is this um, wind tunnel in Australia that includes an APS, an aerodynamic particle sizer, with a probe to sample the particles from different parts of the wind tunnel flow. And then the, um, that the ellipse to the, to the left of the probe is the volunteer's head. So the paper points out that the volunteers for this work have to be um, uh, not claustrophobic. Uh, so this work showed that there are three, three distinct um, sources of, of particle production, the, the lungs, the larynx, and the, or, and the oral cavity. The oral cavity is the only place where large droplets uh, above, in let's say the 50 micron range, is the only place they come from. The larynx and the um, lungs produce smaller droplets. And the most important source for both speaking and coughing is the larynx. Uh, so this is another, another use of an of an aerodynamic particle sizer. In this case, this one's at UC Davis. The subjects uh, talk to this and breathe into a, a, a plastic funnel, which is connected by a hose to the APS. And in, in this work, um, they were talking intermittently. And after each speech, and the speech is recorded by the amplitude on the top, uh, the number of particles um, after the appropriate delay increased and then decreased. So this was the data that um, showed the relationship of uh, talking pressure squared to number of particles and identified the super emitters. Um, a subsequent paper from that group uh, showed that different vowel sounds make different numbers of particles. In particular, the E sound in the upper right uh, produces more particles per second than the ah sound or the other vowel. And as you might expect, um, uh, not, not non-voiced consonants um, produced very few particles and uh, voiced consonants are um, like vowels that produce a lot because the, the larynx, the, f the flapping of the folds in the larynx is what, what um, emits the droplets. Okay, so connection with beam forming, um, I pointed uh, a phased array at myself and made an off sound and confirmed that, uh, that this frequency, the sound was coming from the larynx. So you can see the spot there. Uh, the frequency is 642 hertz. At higher frequency, the sound came from the mouth. At higher frequency still, the sound moved from the mouth to the nose. Looking at the E sound, we can see that it has a much more complicated spectrum than the A ah sound. The Asadi paper says that the process of generating the sound is more energetic 
and produces more uh, respiratory particles. Beamforming it, I can see that at least at this frequency, the sound appears to be coming from my chin. Humidity has three different effects on the propagation of the virus. All three of them lead to high propagation at low humidity. I've already discussed virus stability in the context of a partially evaporated droplet containing a different chemistry that's not favorable to the survival of the virus. The other evaporation effect is on the particle trajectory, which I'll discuss in the next few slides. The third effect is on the intrinsic infection susceptibility of people receiving the particles, and I'll, I'll uh, illustrate that also in the following slides. Evaporation appears to be most important for cough droplets, which are the larger ones. They start at a diameter of between 10 and 1400 microns and then eventually uh, evaporate down to a nucleus that may or may not be solid and has a diameter of between 1 and 10 microns. The physics and chemistry of this evaporation process are quite complicated. Uh, you could consult the references given by Lou or Nets for the details. Okay. Evaporation time. Uh, this is a simple uh, analysis for pure water for a droplet that's just dropped from two meters. So, and the time shown in the box are the the time to for the water to completely evaporate. Uh, so, if it contained the other um, impurities, and then it would, evap it would go down to a nucleus. But if, it, if it's just water, it, it evaporates completely. Uh, at 20% relative humidity and 20 microns, um, it happens in 0.3 seconds. At the other end of the table, um, it takes 35 seconds for the droplet to evaporate. That also happens to be the time that it takes to reach the floor from two meters. If the table were extended to the right, you'd see that for larger droplets, uh, it can happen at lower and lower humidity that so the droplet reaches the floor uh, before, it's, before it evaporates. Uh, Gavin Buxton from Robert Morris University gathered some interesting formulas for droplet trajectories and put them in a spreadsheet. The first equation gives the acceleration in terms of V, which is the velocity of the particle with respect to the ambient flow. If we assume if the acceleration is zero, so the terminal velocity has been reached, then the trajectory of a particle, as Buxton descri describes it, is that it follows the flow, and it's superimposed on that, it falls toward the, the ground at the terminal velocity given by the expression shown. Here, CD is the uh, drag coefficient, and RE is the Reynolds number of the particle, um, rho A is the density of air, and rho D is the density of the particle. In order to know the velocity of the flow that carries the particle, you could measure it or compute it. Examples of computational approaches would include large eddy simulation, lattice Boltzmann, or a commercial package like Fluent. Uh, to model it in detail, it would be important to note that the flow is transient. It's a, it's a puff, and it's multi-phase because the air coming from the person is warmer than the ambient air. Uh, some examples of in the literature are given in the references. Uh, so back to beamforming, um, here's an example of two coughs. So I'm going to beamform the sound made by the, the jet and show its um, transient nature. <coughs> uh, here's another picture of a puff. This is in a um, water tank. So the circle on the right shows the leading vortex of the puff, and the, the pattern, are, um, pattern, the spots are uh, large particles that have settled out of the jet. The smaller ones would have been carried along with it more. As a droplet evaporates, 
its diameter decreases from an initial value of d naught to a minimum value of d min. There's some disagreement in the literature about whether this minimum diameter uh, represents a solid or possibly a liquid with a solid crust around the outside. The reference at the bottom by Lou uh, gives the crust description. In any case, Buxton gives formulas describing the uh, diameter as a function of time. Uh, it says that d is equal to d naught times the square root of 1 minus beta t, where beta is the evaporation rate. Here d is the molecular diffusivity of water vapor. p sat is the um, saturation um, pressure of water vapor and p infinity is the ambient pressure of the water vapor. Okay, so why is d of t important? Well, it changes the trajectory because the um, large uh, heavy particles will fall to the floor no sooner than the light ones that are the, the small evaporated ones that will be carried along with the jet. Uh, now this Analysis was pioneered by, by Wells in 1930, it's either 34 or 35. Um, the analysis was extended and redone by C. And actually, the, that paper was where I got the numbers on the table that I showed a couple of slides ago. Um, so that's one, one importance of D is the trajectory. Another is it changes the amount of water in the droplet. Uh, so as I as I said, at low humidity, uh, the droplet dries out completely or almost completely. The virions are preserved because they're preserved by their lipid envelope. At very high humidity, the virions stay in water that's similar to uh, the salinity where they were created. So they're stable. At intermediate humidity, the droplets, the, the, the water in the droplets has its um, pH reduced and its salinity increased. One or the other apparently is toxic to the um, virons because they, um, they um, create less infection if that's happened to them. Okay, so, so I've got a note to epidemiologists that they might want to uh, try plotting the data as a function of either the evaporation rate or something that's proportional to it, um, like the expression here, um, and if, if um, the evaporation rate is what really governs the effect of, of humidity and temperature, then you should get a better collapse than using relative humidity or absolute hum humidity um, in isolation. Okay, I'll give a, few, a couple more references uh, about um, the stability of viruses um, as a function of our environmental factors. The first one deals with um, COVID-1 and 2, and then uh, Tang is, a, is an older, more general. Here's another example of a laboratory test. In the aerosol exposure simulation chamber, the coughing simul simulator produced particles containing uh, influenza virus, and the breathing simulator received them. Uh, the particles were analyzed to determine how many were infectious. And at low humidity, uh, they were completely infectious. At higher humidity, the, the infectiousness decreased. Uh, very similar to the guinea pig data. Humidity can also affect the intrinsic infection resistance of the person who may or may not become infected. The mechanism for that is assumed to relate to the mucosal layer lining the person's airway. The epithelial cells in the airway have cilia. The cilia move and transport the mucus out of the person. The pathogen particles are trapped in the mucus. The stated mechanism for the effect of humidity on this process is that low humidity leads to thinner and more viscous, viscous mucus and slows the movement of the cilia. This reduces the effectiveness in clearing pathogens and leads to more infection. 
Uh, so what I want to propose here is a is another way to model the um, the the change in the surface caused by the change in humidity. Um, I'll explain what the model is, but it's it's just a guess. It's a convenient mathematical guess, so it, it'll be something that could be tested. So we suppose that the um, the concentration of particles in the air in the, in the person's airway, C, is governed by the convection diffusion equation given here, where V is the um, breathing velocity. And then the boundary of the air condition of the of the airway has a mucosal, mucosal surface, which is characterized by a boundary condition on C. So let's look for a steady state solution. So we have this um, elliptic equation. Um, and the, on the left side of the um, domain, we've, we're going to specify incoming particles. On the right side, um, some sort of outgoing boundary condition. And then on the transverse sides, uh, there's a boundary condition uh, to be determined. Now, if we so assume that all the particles that hit the boundary were absorbed, then we'd apply the Dirichlet boundary condition to say that C equals zero. If we assume that none of the particles were absorbed, um, that would be the Neumann boundary condition. And in between, uh, it turns out to be called the Robin boundary condition, which is mathematically very similar to the acoustic impedance boundary condition. So um, because it's convenient mathematically, um, I propose to speculate that the changes in the mucus affect the impedance. And the significance of that would be that um, it, if the mucus is effective in capturing the particles, then they would not be um, convected to the lungs. Uh, so that, that's a different, little different picture than supposing that the effect is what happens to the particles after they're captured. This is, I'm guessing that the, that the change of the mucus would, would, change, would affect their, their ability to be captured. Given a proposed value of the impedance, it would be possible to solve the convection diffusion equation either in its original form or the parabolic approximation to it to determine how many particles reach the exit of the section of the airway in relation to the number of particles that enter. Uh, the assumption would be that the humidity uh, determines the impedance and then the impedance determines the um, infecti infectiousness by controlling how many particles get past that section of the airway. So summary, um, the effects of humidity is that um, there's a lot of data that humidity is important. Um, the big one, of course, is the, is the seasonality of influenza. There's the other epidemiological data or, um, of things like schools. And there's laboratory data, uh, for example, the guinea pigs. Um, so it's the mechanisms proposed are that high humidity slows droplet um, evaporation. This reduces the range of some droplets, and the partially evaporated droplets uh, have chemistry that's unfavorable to virus stability. And furthermore, um, high humidity may um, improve the ability of people to avoid um, becoming infected by changing their intrinsic susceptibility. So next, next slide is some research suggestions um, or ideas um, that um, physics and engineering people like us could use to contribute to this um, biology problem. Uh, one would be using uh, a flow solver uh, to study uh, study and building environments to, um, to see what tuning HVAC systems or tuning in or augmenting HVAC systems with water, what that would do. Uh, also masks could be studied and the effect of social distancing could be studied. Uh, and, and it has been um, uh, 
in some of the references that I give um, show some social distancing um, uh, results in terms of oh, like one, one big question is is the is the six foot distance sufficient and they all say no um, uh, another thing that could be studied is um, the generation of droplets in the larynx um, so a simple picture of that would be as the folds in the larynx pull apart a bubble forms so that could be studied uh, and also the, the modeling of droplets in the lung and the oral cavity. Uh, another thing to study would be um, numerical airway modeling uh, by the diffusion model that I gave or something else. Um, I should say that there has been work in this area in the context of, of um, smoke and other types of pollution and also drug delivery. Uh, if the boundary condition that I'm proposing is going to be used, it would have to be tested um, somehow to, to be sure that it has biological meaning. Okay, so the other part of the summary is um, short-term intervention. Uh, so what I've done here is just quote the tips at the end of this um, virology review paper by Moriana. Uh, and the number one tip is humidi humidification of indoor air to maintain a humidity between 40 and 60 percent relative. Um, and then there are some others. Ventilation is obviously important if you've got these um, floating infective nuclei, it would be best to get them out of the out of the room. And then face masks. Uh, another effect of face masks is would, is, would be to keep the um, nose warm and moist to improve the intrinsic resistance. Uh, the vitamin D is about uh, another theory for the seasonality of, of influenza that um, dark winters lead to less sunlight, leads to less vitamin D, um, giving a vitamin D deficiency. Um, to me, the humidity uh, story is compelling. Uh, sleeping for more than seven hours a, a day to maintain um, your immune system and hand washing, of course. Uh, what I have next is the references, and what I, what I propose to do is flip through them. Just to, um, so the first two are the um, uh, UC Davis reports that uh, UC the aerodynamic particle sizer with the plastic funnel uh, and study speech. Uh, in the middle is um, Gavin Buxton. That's the spreadsheet model of um, of the key formulas from particle transmission. Uh, Jim Coronas is my graduate advisor who I learned how to do the wave splitting from. Uh, there's some of my relevant papers. Uh, the reference at the bottom by Lou is the detailed analysis of droplet evaporation, um, including analysis of the concentrations of the solutes and the vapor pressure and temperature. Um, so Lowen, so the two papers by Lowen are the 2007 and 2014 papers about guinea pigs. Uh, so uh, this is the work that um, strongly shows the importance of humidity as well as temperature for seasonality of, of um, influenza. Um, the Metal is a paper about uh, physics. So it has a lot of, it covers a lot of the same ground that this presentation does and some things that, that I didn't mention. Um, okay, Moriyama, that's the annual review of virology. That's a very important paper that has the graph of, of the, of, well, it has a different presentation of the, the seasonality of different viruses and has the, the explanation of of the effect of on the mucosal um, layer and the, the tips at the end, including um, relative humidity of around 50%. This slide includes a reference to a paper by Doug Nark and his colleagues about C. duct lark. There are a number of papers from 
Doug and others at NASA uh, Langley, but I just picked one to be representative. The third reference here is the important paper by Wells from 1934. The last one on the slide is one of the papers by Yang and Marr discussing the effect of humidity on the concentration of the chemicals in the droplets and the implications for uh, virus stability. They also have several other papers. I recommend tracking them down. So this is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions.